I have read so many books, I've gone through so many pages, and these are my favorite. Hello, and welcome to Lit Life with Miranda Reads. Today, we're talking about the best books of 2020. I have literally read my way through 125 books published in 2020, and I am giving you my top 10 of the year. Okay, so I will have to admit, I do have a handful of honorable mentions, which we'll go through first. So my honorable mentions this year are Thorn, Marie Lou's Sky Hunter, How the King of Elfheim, <laughs> How the King of Elfheim Learned to Hate Stories. Yes, I got two copies. Whoops. A Thorn is a retelling of one of my favorite, favorite stories, The Goose Girl. Now, The Goose Girl is a classic, classic tale all about a princess and her helper, her maid. Kind of depends on which version of the story you're getting. The two of them switch spots. The princess is normally tricked out of her princess ship and then the assistant lady and waiting takes her position. Meanwhile, the princess lives her life as a goose girl and ends up learning a lot of valuable lessons. And this is a gorgeous, gorgeous retelling. I loved the characters. They're the kind of characters where you want to just meet them and you want to be with them and you want to spend as much time as possible with them. The atmosphere is really well done and I really like how this one isn't a strict retelling. Intazar Karani adds in her own personal flair to this story and I really feel like that elevates it. So if you are a huge fairy tale remake fan, this book is for you. Also, I'm really excited because their sequel is coming out in 2021, which follows some of the characters from the original story. So I'm really excited about that. Okay, so the next one might surprise you all because I am so vocal about her. Marie Lu. As I've said before, I am, I am not a huge Marie Lu fan. I haven't read all of her books, so I am slightly withholding judgment there, but I have read her War Cross duology and The Kingdom of Back standalone. And finally, I have one that I loved. This book follows Talon. She lives in the country of Mar, which is the last of the free nations. Talon is a striker, so that means she fights and tries to take down ghosts, aka mutated humans bent on destroying the humans of Mara. In the beginning of this book, her longtime partner is infected by one of the ghosts and he dies. So she is currently partnerless. She can't go out on the war front until there is a prisoner that comes to town. One with a mysterious past, a chip on his shoulder, and the potential for a new future. I loved the way the characters were done with this one. I loved the war that was created. It had a slightly Attack on Titans vibe with the way the ghost slash monsters slash mutated humans would come after the regular humans. But at the same time, it was different enough that I was able to enjoy it. The only thing that got me with this book and kind of kept it out of the top 10 for me was the science. <laughs> I am pretty close to graduating with my PhD in biophysics and the science in this one felt like it was stretching it a little bit too much, but not enough that I would fully pull out the story. So at the end of the day, I was really enjoying this one and I think it was a really good book. And I know, I know I put the queen of nothing on my earlier prediction list because let's be real, it was amazing and it did win the Goodreads Choice Awards for best YA fantasy. However, Comma. I am a huge fairy tale fan, and because of that, the companion novel actually edged out the Queen of Nothing trilogy end for me. This focuses on Cardin. He is the cruel prince of the cruel prince. Essentially, this book goes through his childhood, his teenagehood, his adult life, 
and has all these fairy tales kind of weave in and out of his story. It is beautifully illustrated. Like you have, it's just like gorgeous. And I actually accidentally ordered two of them. I have the Owl Crate version, which has um, custom end papers. It has a gorgeous cover art as well, which, whoo, overwhelmingly beautiful. And I also have the uh, one, a version that I ordered online that was signed for Miranda. At the end of the day, King of Elfheim, How You Learn to Hate Stories, you could honestly read that one as a standalone, and I feel like that would work out pretty well. However, you probably wouldn't get as much of a takeaway unless you read the original trilogy. Good news is that trilogy was awesome, though, so it wouldn't be a waste of time, if that makes sense. Alright, so now we've hit the top 10 books of the year. The Guest List. And that one is a gorgeous locked door mystery, which is actually one of the pop sugar reading challenges for 2021. And on a side note, I'm so excited for that. I'm already working on a video for it. Anyway, though, the guest list focuses on a wedding that's on a closed off remote Irish island and someone ends up dead. And you try and figure out along with the characters who did it, why? And the more you learn, the more motives there are, and the less likely it looks to figuring out the answer. I definitely have said this before, but like it's one of those books that if you talk too much about it, it really gives the answer away. So I'm going to keep it as a mystery. Just know that if you're looking for like a very atmospheric book, a very like whodunit, a very like, wow, that was dark kind of book, it is a great recommendation for that. Number nine. Now I know, I know, I know, I know. So as you all know, I am a huge Sarah J Maas fan. And she creates such gloriously intricate worlds and I was so psyched for this book. However, I cannot put it any higher on the list because to be frank, the first 300 pages kind of sucked for me. So to put this in perspective, the world building for this book is huge. At least it is to me. I haven't read a lot of high fantasy novels. So to have magic coexisting with technology, coexisting with archaic knowledge, to have werewolves, vampires, fairies, shapeshifters, etc. all in one world made me feel very lost. I couldn't figure out what the rules of the world was and how everyone fit together. It felt like almost like I was reading like the third book of a series and that continued for the first 300 pages. But after that, it was great. <laughs> so after that 300 page mark, there's another about 400 or so pages of the book, which was amazing. So it really says something that like the first 300 pages are like, eh, but I'm still loving the book after that so much that I put it on this top 10 list. Long story short, it is wonderfully written. I love the mystery. I love the characters and I loved the world building. It just felt like an uphill battle to get into this one. Number eight, A Deadly Education. So this book follows Elle. She goes to the School of Man's School, which is kind of like a school for the magically gifted, like in Harry Potter. However, people drop like flies, like in the Nevernight trilogy. In this school, you are trained in magic, but you don't have teachers, friendships, holidays, anything like that. Your goal is to go to the school at the beginning and live long enough to graduate. And even when you're starting to graduate, there's a lot of people who end up dying during it. There are monsters hidden behind every corner. There's poisons. There's all kinds of trickery. Elle is uniquely suited to this school because of her particularly dark brand of magic. However, she refuses to use it because using it, she feels would change who she is as a person. So now she needs to figure out how to literally survive school and also how to thrive in an environment where she is constantly holding back on her own powers, which would also save her. I really loved the deadliness of this school and I loved the characters in it. It was fascinating to watch Elle interact 
and the creativity of the monsters in this one the way the author creates all these creatures and all the sneaky things that happen in the school i really was addicted to reading that so i would definitely definitely recommend this book it was really really good one which is number seven might surprise people a bit because it's a romance and you know me I don't read a lot of romances this one is written in the stars and it's a Pride and Prejudice remake we follow Darcy and she is a very I would say kind of straight-laced businesswoman she doesn't have time to find a relationship she doesn't have time for emotions she just wants to keep chugging through life and we follow Elle Al is a free thinking, she is a happy go lucky girl focused on star charts and using astronomy to predict love and all that kind of junk. Al and Darcy get set up for a blind date which goes horribly wrong. And Darcy lies to her brother saying that it went amazing. So now the two of them have to fake this relationship and it might just become real. I am a huge Pride and Prejudice fan. And I am also a huge fan of fake it till you make it relationship books. So combine the two of them and we have a classic. I really, really enjoyed the character development in this one. And I really loved the way the two of them danced around each other. Number six, Felix. Felix is a lovely contemporary focusing on a young artist who happens to be trans. He came out to his family ages ago and while life isn't as perfect as he had hoped, it is a lot better than what it was. He is able to present as male, he is able to live his life as male. There are things that aren't quite at his expectations, but the book focuses on how he works through that. Now somebody at his current school outed him. Dead names him and creates a portrait gallery based off of old Instagram photos of Felix pre-transition. Felix is understandably hurt, shocked, and he figures out, or at least he fi thinks he figures out who was behind it and he decides to get revenge. Now this book takes you through an emotional roller coaster. I really enjoyed the relationship development in this book and also the character development. Felix at the beginning was very reactionary, and understandably so, but it felt very young high school mentality. And at the end of the book, he was very much matured and more settled within himself. I loved watching his growth, and I loved watching him become comfortable within himself. I also really loved the way gender identity was explored in this book. So if you're interested in it, I would definitely recommend picking that one up. Number five, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. This is a hefty book. So Christopher Poloni, author of the Aragon series, I'm sure it comes to no surprise that I'm a huge fan of that series and I've been waiting for him to write a new book for what feels like a decade, which it honestly might be a decade at this point. This one follows Kira, alien biologist. She touches the wrong organism. It becomes like a suit on top of her skin and it slowly starts changing her and who she is and she has to struggle with the suit versus life versus space versus everything collapsing at once. I was really pleasantly surprised by this one. I'm not normally one for sci-fi and it makes this book makes me think like I really should consider getting more into sci-fi. I really, really enjoyed the science behind this one. It felt very, very solid. Mind you, I'm getting my PhD in biophysics, not in astrophysics. That being said, nothing really struck me as like, what the heck? So I really did enjoy that aspect of this book. Plus, I really want to be like an alien biologist now. That sounds like a, such a fun career. Except for when like magical suits try and take over your body. That part might not be as fun, but like the rest of it sounded like pretty cool. <laughs> So long story short, I did enjoy this. Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Ooh. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. 
in this book. We follow Addie, and it's a dual storyline, one in modern era and one in 300 years ago. 300 years ago, Addie makes a prayer to the wrong God, asking to be saved from marriage. The God grants her her wish, but with the caveat, she is cursed with forgetfulness. Well, okay, not her, but like anyone who runs into her will forget that she exists as soon as they leave the room. At any point, if she wants to give up, the God will get her soul. We spend this book following her throughout different parts of her life and why she chooses to keep going and what beauty out there in this world keeps her from wanting to give up on life. It's not one of those books where there's like this big overarching plot, this evil government to overthrow. It's literally like slice of life throughout Addie's existence and what it was like to go through this, to go through that, to do this, to do that. And I really liked the slower pacing of this book. It was really well done. And it's one of those books that takes you on such a journey that at the end of it, you're like, what now? You all know this one was coming on the list. I have flaunted my vegetarian vampire shirt far more often than I ever should have on YouTube, but Midnight Sun. So Midnight Sun is literally Twilight from Edward's perspective. We get all of the same events, but we get Edward's thoughts and feelings and actions on them. We get a little bit more than what Bella sees in Twilight because we have Edward doing this in the background, Edward doing that in the background, etc. But for the most part, it really is just Twilight, but like Edward's version, which makes it feel kind of odd that it's this high on this list. Because it's not often where you have essentially the same book from different perspectives be completely different and feel completely different. But that's what happened here. It was really wonderfully done. Edward's perspective is very anxiety prone, if that makes sense, where he's constantly worrying and constantly thinking, overthinking things. But at the same time, I was really entertained by what was happening. Also, in the first book of Twilight, Edward feels very out of the story. Like, we see Bella trying to figure him out, but he's very much a wall to her at that point. However, when we talk about Midnight Sun, we figure out what was going behind that wall. And to me, that was fascinating. Number two is Among the Beasts and Briars. Among the Beasts and Briars is written by Ashley Poston, and she's the same person who wrote Geekarella, which I really did enjoy. This one is her foray into fantasy. Essentially, there is a kingdom surrounded by a forest that's insurmountable. The forest is filled with old gods and creatures and creeping vines and infectious plants. And no one can ever venture in there and come back alive. We follow the daughter of a gardener. On the eve of her best friend, aka the future queen's coronation, the forest attacks. And Ceres, which is the daughter of the gardener, is one of the very last people alive. She and a fox decide to go into the forest and try and figure out what the magical kingdom of legends used to keep the forest at bay. This is one of those books that is just pure, unadulterated magic. I love, love, love the way the magic works in this world. And it might just be me, but it's the kind of book where I just want to read a whole book about the magic system, like figure out the rules, the creatures, the everything. I just get obsessed by it. So this book was really beautifully written. I loved the romance in it, and I loved just watching this adventure unfold in front of my eyes. The various things that they run into the forest had a very scary fairy vibe, which is one of my favorite vibes out there <laughs> for fairy tales. And it just, it has that old story feel, but with like a modern twist. And last but not least, the number one book I have read in 2020, Anxious People. 
by Friedrich Bachmann. Anxious People focuses on a robbery slash kidnapping gone wrong. A robber decides to take money from the bank, but when he gets there, he realizes that the bank is a cashless bank. So he runs up to the apartments on the next floor and accidentally kidnaps a bunch of people who are doing a tour. Now, like most Friedrich Bachmann's books, it starts off as one thing, but very quickly changes into another thing. I was loving the plot. It was so wild. It went back and forth and this way, that way, as each little plot twist was revealed. It was amazing. It also made me laugh, cry, laugh. <laughs> what I mean was this book, I would literally laugh out loud while I was reading it. One paragraph later, I'd be crying. And then another page later, I would be laughing again. He has this amazing way of just taking like a few words and creating these well-developed, 100% 3D and just richly made characters. Like we were getting like six, seven perspectives. Each one was 110% unique and each one was just, it felt like a real person, which is not something you typically get when you have such wide characters. So it 110% made my very top book of the year because it was just so encompassing and so wonderful and it made me laugh and made me cry. I just didn't know what to feel, but I loved it. All right, all in all, those were my top 10, I guess technically top 13 with my honorable mentions, but that was my top 10 books of the year. List them all down below in case you wanna check them out. Thank you so, so much for watching. And now I gotta read a lot of 2021 books so I can do this for next year. All right, have a great day and happy reading. Bye.